Mm -hmm. Our little subtitle there, even uh, underneath the, the main title, Even Evil Had a Beginning. We've been talking about that, been looking at different aspects. And this morning, we're going to um, ask the question, why is Satan so angry? Uh, why is he spending all of his time uh, being upset? Why doesn't he just move on and go do, you know, something else? Why, why is he feeling this way? And we're going to uh, explore that this morning. Let's have a prayer. Father, we come before you this morning uh, humbling ourselves. Father, you indeed are an awesome God, a mighty God, a great God. Father, you are our God. And as we come before you, we open our Bibles and we search understanding from your word. And Father, may we grow in our Bible knowledge. May we grow in this topic of Satan that we are studying this morning. And Father, always, as we learn, may we help others to learn as well. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and turn over to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. And we'll begin in verse 3 and then we'll work our way down to, to verse 6. Uh, we'll begin in verse 1. Luke 22, beginning there in verse 1. Now, the feast on, of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, that's Jesus, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and confessed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him, that's Christ, to them in the absence of the multitude. Satan's looking for an opening. He's looking for an opportunity to carry out his ultimate plan. I've got to do something about the Christ. And so he's using all kinds of different things to cause difficulties in the world. And we're going to look at some of those here in just a second. But he begins this idea, Satan, of bringing an attack upon Jesus because there's already people who want to kill him. And you see that there in verse 2. It says, Then Satan entered Judas. Interesting little phrase here. The Greek word is isokamahi, and it can be used literally and figuratively. It can be used in a literal sense. I entered into the store. Uh, it can be used in a a uh, figurative sense. Um, boy, that cold really entered me, really got in me. Um, in, in here, I think, uh, contextually, we're looking at an influence. We're looking at something that is figurative. Um, Satan wants to use the, uh, wants to exert an influence on Judas to help the chief priests and the scribes to carry out their wish to kill him. Well, yeah, re recapping the thing. Yes, yes. Um, and the chief priest, you know, so he says, I can do this and I can use Judas. So there's a couple of things that we might suggest here of how he influenced him, entered him, influenced him. Um, it could be that Judas was prideful in the fact that in John chapter 12 and verse 48, Jesus rebukes him. And so maybe Satan can use that. Maybe it is that that's the perfume one where he wanted to sell the, the perfume and, and, you know, use the money. And Jesus says, you know, no, that's not right. Let, let this woman alone. So it, it could be that 
uh, his pride was hurt. And so Satan is going to enter or influence Judas to use his pride to help the Pharisees and the scribes to carry out their plan to kill Jesus. That could be one way in which Satan is working. Okay. Another way that he could be working on Judas is right there in the text. Maybe he's greedy. And if you think about it, he agrees to, um, in verse 4, he agrees how he might uh, betray him. And in verse 5, how might he do it? If he does it, it comes down to money. If I can get some money, I'll be willing to do it. Now, I think that's a pretty good reason for Judas because that really matches with John chapter 12 and verses 4 through 8 because the issue there is money. And the issue here is money. Could that be how Satan is influencing Judas, his desire to be rich? His desire to gain some money, perhaps. Perhaps it was the providential work of God that, that Judas would, would be used in this way to bring about this betrayal. The thing that I want us to take away from it is one of anger. Satan sees that people are angry with Jesus. They want to kill him. And he sees that Judas has an issue and so he wants to exploit it. And he wants to do all of this because he's angry. He's not looking to exploit what the religious leaders are doing because he's happy. He's not looking to enter Judas, influence Judas, use Judas, and go through money because he's happy. He's angry. He's angry in this instance here against Christ. And the fact that there's an influence over the multitudes. Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the one that we've been waiting for? What about those miracles that have been taking place? What about his teaching? He teaches like no one we've ever heard. Could, could this be the one? And it causes an anger in Satan. I give you some ideas of the anger of Satan in some different uh, aspects. The names of Satan reveal, of course, that he is angry. The way in which he is named, the way in which he is referred to in Scripture. We won't look at all the verses, I'll just make mention to them. But his primary names, which we've talked about these. His name of being called Satan, which is the adversary, Matthew 4.10. He's referred to as the devil, which is an accuser. Or a slanderer, Matthew 4 and verse 1. That's the temptation account of Jesus. His secondary names reveal that he is angry. Uh, in Revelation 9 and verse 10, he's called Abaddon and Apollyon. Abaddon means destruction in the Hebrew. And Apollyon means destroyer in the Greek. Right. Sounds like he's angry. Revelation 2 and verse 10, he's called the accuser. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, he's called the adversary. In Matthew 13 and verse 39, he's an enemy. In Matthew 13 and verse 19, he's an evil one. In John 8 and verse 44, he's a murderer. He's a liar. In Revelation 12 and verse 9, he's the great dragon. Does anything about being a dragon convey to you peacefulness or joy? Or does it convey to you anger? Okay, um, all the times that Satan is referred to in the scriptures. And if you're looking at your concordance, you have to look in different ways. Satan, you have to look at, at uh, uh, the devil, uh, you, you, there are other ways, the evil one, things like that. But if you look at all the different ways in which Satan is referenced in the Bible, not one of them is ever in the positive. Not one of those names is ever given with any type of connotation of having hope. And I think the thing that is interesting about that is when you think about Satanism, and we're going to talk about the worship of Satan today in another study. But when you think about those who give themselves over to Satanism in the worship of, 
of Satan. They're worshiping somebody who is referred to every single time in the Bible in a negative sense, yet they're trying to make something positive out of it. He's our Lord and God, yet he's never referred to that in Scripture. He's the great one, yet he's never referred to that way in Scripture. How is he referred? He's angry. He's angry. Another thing that we see is that the works of Satan, those are the names of Satan. Um, a second thing is that the works of Satan reveal that he is angry. And we looked at this as well. Satan uses different types of social ills to show his anger. He uses alcohol. Proverbs 20 and verse 1. He uses um, uh, Im impurity. Proverbs 6 and verse 32 and adultery. He uses Matthew 5 and verse 28, the lust of the flesh. He uses Galatians 5, 19 through 21, the works of the flesh. He uses Matthew 19 and verse 9, the idea of uh, unscriptural divorce. None of these are a positive thing. It's never stated as being, it's good that that individual was drunk. Or it's never, you know, presented in the idea that, well, it's, it's good that that person is living a life in adultery. These are all negative things. They are all social ills. Even if they find acceptance in society. Even if they find acceptance in society. Let me suggest to you. That Satan is able to work more effectively through these social ills because they do find acceptance. There's not the reservation that there used to be about these things that are sinful. And when they find acceptance, people do them more or give in to them more or do them more publicly because it's gained an acceptance. Homosexuality is a great example. It's a great example. Something that was never talked about, something that was never presented as being in a good way, now is openly promoted, not just in the movies, not just with gay characters on TV shows. It's openly promoted in our community by people who have no problem making it absolutely clear to you that they're a homosexual. Satan can use that. Why does he want to use that? Because he's angry. He's upset. Um, and so as these things find, uh, you know, it's not illegal to get drunk. This is a common misconception. It's illegal to, to drink and to drive drunk. That's illegal. It's illegal to be drunk in public. That's illegal. But if you want to sit on your couch and drink yourself silly, you're more than welcome to do that. Nobody's going to kick in your front door and say, oh, you're drunk on your couch. It's legal. Okay? Um, you, if, if, if being drunk was not legal, bars would go out of business. And, and so you, you have the, the acceptance and the use of these things, and Satan takes advantage of them, these social ills. Another thing is Satan uses persecution against us to show his anger. Notice, I give you a little larger context here. Go over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4. And we usually look at, at verse 16, but I want you to back up to verse 12. 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. And Peter begins here with something very interesting because he, he begins with an acknowledgement. I, I, I know we end up in verse 16. I, 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 I know where we're going. But he begins with an acknowledgement. And he says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Before he ever gets to, if you suffer as a Christian, verse 16, 
Before he does that, he says, listen, that you're being persecuted. Don't think something odd is happening to you. Something strange is taking place. Don't think that this is abnormal, that you can't figure out. I, I don't know why there's people who are in opposition to me. I never expected it. He says, "That's don't think that way. He, he affirms the fact that it happens. And he says, but rejoice. It's your mindset. It's your disposition. Satan is using things against us to harm us because he's angry. One of those things that he uses is persecution. One of the things that Peter tries to redirect our mind to is in persecution, rejoice in something. He says, rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Um, how would we, let me give you, um, let me, let me give you, uh, let me modernize that verse a little bit. Um, uh, rejoice in the fact that your suffering is going to be rewarded. When Christ comes, your suffering will find rewardment. Okay? Then he goes on, he says, if you are reproached, he's already talked about persecution. He's already talked about the mindset that you should have in persecution. And then he says, if you are reproached, now he gives an example. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Holy Spirit, on their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. You're glorifying God in your persecution. It depends on how you're responding to it. Paul and Silas singing praises to God in a, in a Roman prison were glorifying God. They were, they were bringing about his part to be uh, glorified. If they were in prison cursing the cause of Christ because they've been arrested, then they would be blasphemy. Then in verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Mind your own business. Don't suffer because you can't keep your mouth shut. Don't suffer because you can't keep your nose out of other people's business. Okay? Don't say, woe is me, I'm being uh, persecuted, everything's bad, when you're an evildoer, when you're a thief, when you're a murderer. Don't try and make that argument, woe is me. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Now, you hear me say this all the time. That verse reads so easy. I have no hesitation whatsoever to read verse 16. It just flows off the page with no problem. But it sure is difficult in application. Take up your cross daily. Follow Christ. That reads so easy. But it can be difficult in application. And, and I think that Satan knows this. And because he's our foe, remember? Because he's our adversary, remember? Because he's the slanderer, remember? He understands the difficulty that there is in, in verse 16 of suffering as a Christian. And how we ought not to be ashamed and how we should glorify God. So it matters that in the face of persecution, how we respond is a way in which Satan can use us or not. Yes, uh, a handsome man in the back.
I do. I, I, I don't believe today in the Christian dispensation. I don't believe the Bible teaches um, um, possession, but oppression. Instead of possession, there's oppression. And Satan oppresses people today through these different things that we might be uh, looking at, uh, the things that are taking place. Um, yeah, when, when, you know, and that's <laughs> a cat looking in the door. Um, <laughs> get that cat, we'll baptize it. Um, I, I think it's more of oppression. Um, I, I, we're gonna do we're gonna do a lesson on that, and so I don't want to jump too far ahead into that. And I, Troy's mentioned some stuff uh, to me, and um, so it's it's something. But I, I don't believe in the miraculous age. I don't. Uh, excuse me, that is a misstatement. I do believe that there was a miraculous age. I do believe that miracles happened. Let me walk that back. Um, but I believe the time for miracles with the ending of the apostleship uh, and those who uh, had their uh, uh, manifestations of the Holy Spirit given to them, when they died out, those uh, abilities died with them. And today we have the scriptures, the Bible. And so um, I, I, I don't think that the idea of possession is at play more so than it is oppression. Yes. Right. Yeah. No, I understand. Ter that's terrible of you. You want to? No. I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Let me, I don't want to get, don't, I'll, I'll, I'll chase this rabbit just so far, because we're going to talk about this. Um, when, it, when it comes to demon possession in the New Testament, when clearly demon possession is taking place, okay, demons are being cast out. Christ is talking about demons. You're seeing uh, teachings on demons. Um, you're, you're, you're seeing that demons crave flesh 
in some way. You remember those demons that identified themselves as being legion? I mean, there were thousands of demons in this one person. And when Jesus is going to cast them out, they say, let us go into the swine. I mean, they want to be in flesh, it appears. Okay? But every instance of demon possession in the New Testament is clearly manifested. There's no secret about it. Is this person demon-possessed? I don't know. Maybe. It was known they're demon-possessed. They admitted that they were demon-possessed. The Gadarean didn't deny that he was uh, not demon-possessed. He, he admitted it. So when you find those encounters in the New Testament, there's never a hiding. Now, we got to remember there's Hollywood and then there's the Holy Word. And Hollywood and the Holy Word aren't the same. Okay? So I like, I'm a, I like zombies. Man, I like, I like me a good zombie story. Um, I, you know, I, I like werewolves and Dracula and, you know, all those, those things. Of course, they're imaginary. Of course, they're not real. Of course, they've ne they can't be substantiated. But demon possession was. It was proven to be true. Now, today, and especially in Hollywood, you have all these movies where the person hides the fact that they're demon possessed. I don't want anybody to know. They got this alternate plan. They don't want, you know, they're hiding it. They're keeping it a secret. The Omen is a good example uh, the movie The Omen about a man who's, uh, who's indwelt by the devil and he's going to rise. He's the Antichrist and he's going to rise up to be president and going to lead the world. And it was hidden. Didn't want anybody to know that he was demon possessed. Why? So I, you have a clear difference between New Testament possession and what's claimed to be modern day possession. You have a, you have a difference. Gene. Yeah, you know, in a way, I, look, I I think we underestimate the oppression that takes place. the The reason why I began with uh, with Luke twenty two is because clearly evil is at work, and evil is at work using Judas. Satan entered him, so it, there there is a plan and a purpose to use Jesus to ultimately lead to the Pharisees getting their way to, to put Christ on the cross. So he's, he's using that influence upon Satan, I mean, uh, upon Judas. And could it be the money influence? I presented that to you. Maybe it's Judas's desire for money. Maybe it's Judas being upset that he got rebuked and he's being prideful of it. Maybe it's Judas reaching the point where he no longer believes that Jesus is who he claims he is. And he's doubting. I don't know. Maybe it's one of those things. But I know this. Satan is using him. Verse 3, he entered into him. Influenced him. Now, I would never say in a million years that that influence is gone today. That influence is still there. Okay? And I, and I think that's what he uses in people. Troy. I know that it gets presented that way. 
the, the other thing that I would say is in the New Testament, the examples of demons being dealt with, they're cast out. Why aren't these demons being cast out today? Why didn't uh, somebody who says, I'm demon possessed, okay, demon out, and the demon goes out. Why, why, why is that not happening? Why is it taking hold and it can't get out? You know, even Jesus said that there's difficult ones. Some don't come out but by prayer and fasting. I, I, I get it, but they came out. They were obedient. And so, you know, you don't see that today. You see them unable to get rid of the demon, yes. Right. Yeah, and, and that's another thing about... about um, how that stuff works to get day. I, I've you've read the Bible. I've read the Bible. You've read it. There's no formula that was ever used in the Old or New Testament regarding casting out demons. There was no formula. And today you have all these formulas. You must have this cross, and they always open this big old ancient looking book, right? And they put it down, and they start quoting from it. You know all this. Where's that? Where's that in the New Testament? Where's that ritual? Um, you, you don't find those things. You find demons. Um, um, should I use the word obedient? You find them responding. Uh, you find them obeying when they're told uh, to leave. In modern day demon possession, it doesn't happen that way. They somehow have the power and the authority to uh, take hold of this person and not leave. That's interesting to me because I don't read about that in, in the lifetime of Christ. Um, so anyway, we're going to do a whole section. on. We're going to do a lesson on angels. We're going to do a lesson on... De you know, I, I, Alexander Campbell wrote in 1841, he wrote a... a, a he gave a speech um, and very few... He, okay, he wrote in a, in a publication called The Millennial Harbinger. He was the editor of it. And before that, he wrote a publication called The Christian Baptist. So you have writings that he has. But very few of Alexander Campbell's sermons were ever written down. He was extempor extemporaneous. He would have a passage or a thought, and he would preach from it. So there was no written record of it. It's a... It's an interesting fact that in 1841, he gave a lecture in which it was written. And in that lecture, it was on demonology. I just read it, 32 pages. That's a long lecture. Um, in that, he talks about demonology, and he makes the argument that some people in the church hold today. Of course, this didn't originate with Alexander Campbell. He's just espousing it. He's just mentioning it. And that is the idea that Guy and Woods believed the same way. Uh, Campbell believed that demons were the spirits of evil men, that when they died, their spirit was set loose to dwell in people. And so that's why there was demon. That's why there's demon possession, because the evil spirits of men were set free and they possessed people. Um, some today in the brotherhood still believe that. Okay? I don't. Um, and I think there's several reasons why. If the spirit of an evil man can indwell an individual and make them do bad things, then why can't the spirit of a good man indwell a person and make them do good things? The bad guys got free will. The good guys got free will. You know, I, I mean, it's 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 just interesting that one is given so much authority and power, and the other isn't. Demons are made to be so powerful, but all of a sudden Christians are made to be so weak. That they can't even say to a demon, get out. They're so strong and powerful, yet we're feeble. I, I don't like that.
Lazarus was in paradise and he was in torments. Yeah. Yes. It has no New Testament authority. And the thing about that that I would... I'll, I'll give me get you, Ed. The thing about that that I would also um, mention is that there, uh, Abraham, uh, Abraham, the rich man makes it clear... Uh, Abraham makes it clear to the rich man that he can't even go back. He can't even go back and talk to his brother. So when you die, your fate is fixed. You ain't going in. There's no, remember the movie Ghost? There, Patrick Swayze, there's no in-between world if you don't go into the light. And there's no, and you float around on earth and influence people. That's, that's not, yeah, that's not the New Testament. Brother Ed. Right. Right. I agree. Um, I can't remember. Uh, the, the study that I'm doing isn't complete. It's halfway written on my thing. So uh, by no means have the scripture verses memorized. Zachariah somewhere that God will cause in that day. God will cause the evil spirits to be removed from the land. There's a binding that takes place. That Listen, that's a. There's lots of feelings on that and things. And that's a study that we are going to get on to, um, but it's interesting. Um, so Satan uses persecution. Here's another thing. Uh, Satan's opposition to the gospel seed shows his anger. And we uh, actually looked at this um, in uh, Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13. And you can just go down to the end part of it, verse 38, um, where it says, The field is the word, the good seed are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. Those tares that were sowed among the good seed, the, the, the parable of the seed. Some fell on this ground, so, uh, soil. Some fell on that soil. Some fell on some other soil. Right? Satan uses, and that the soil is individual. Um, Satan sees opportunity in the soil of different individuals um, to cause problems, to uh, work against them, to uh, manifest his anger in the things that, that he is upset about. So he has an opposition to the word of God. Why? Because it is truth, John 17, 17, and he hates truth. He's the father of lies. Okay. It's because it's the power of God unto salvation, um, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. And he is as opposed to salvation as one can possibly be. He's the accuser of the brethren. Really? Are they right? Are you sure? Really? Were they good enough? Did they do this? I remember when they acted like that. He's the accuser of the brethren. He hates salvation, Romans 1 and verse 16. It's the gospel. Right? John 17, 17, it's the truth. Uh, so he, he stands in opposition to the word 
of, of God. And then um, if you turn over, uh, Satan's desire is to harm humans, and that shows his anger. Uh, Job chapter 1, verse 11 through uh, 12, he wants to touch all that Job has. He, um, I, I, he hates Job. Why? Because Job is faithful. He's faithful to God. Uh, then in, in, in chapter 2, verses 5 through 6, he wants to harm him physically. Why? Because he hates Job. Why? Because Job is God-fearing. Because God is uh, faithful. He wants to harm us. Okay? And then his longing is to see man uh, sin shows his anger. I already gave you Judas, Luke. Think of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 6. Um, he didn't appear to Eve to help her out in her relationship with God. He appeared to hurt her and Adam. Not to help them be stronger and more committed in their relationship. To cause them to stumble. To bring sin into a world that did not know sin. Adam and Eve hadn't sinned. They didn't know it. And he introduced it. Why? Because he hates humanity. So he's angry. Some of the things that I give you. Why is Satan so angry with Christian? I give you... Uh, 14, and you say, why didn't you just round it up to 15? Because uh, I ran out of space. Um, but these are ideas that give you an understanding of why Satan specifically is so angry at, at, at Christians. He's angry because Christians are a saved people. Acts chapter 16, 30 through 33. It makes him mad that we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 in verse 7, Satan's angry because Christians are a prayerful people. James 5, verse 16, we talk to God. You think that makes him happy? Satan's angry because we're a faithful people. Satan's angry because we're a studious people. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Uh, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. He hates that we go to the Word. He hates that we study what God has revealed to us. He's angry about it. Um, Satan is angry because Christians are a repented people. 1 John 1, 8 through 9. We, we, it's the second law of pardon. There's the first law and the second law of pardon. The first law of pardon is when you become a New Testament Christian and you're forgiven of your sins. The second law of pardon is when you're already a Christian and you sin, you repent of it. So the first way in which one is forgiven is through repentance that leads to baptism. The second way in which forgiveness is given is when a Christian repents of their sin. You've committed sin. Did you go get rebaptized, Or did you repent? You repented. Those who are outside of Christ, they don't have repentance yet. They have immersion in water to have their sins washed away. Acts 22 and verse 16. Okay. The problem is non-Christians run over to 1 John and they say, See, all I have to do is repent and God's forgiven. It ain't written to you. John's writing to Christians. Right? Peter is talking in Acts chapter 2 to non-Christians. Paul is talking to the Philippian jailer, a non-Christian. Philip is talking to the Ethiopian eunuch, a non-Christian. All of them were told to be baptized so their sins could be remitted, taken away. A Christian has repentance. Okay? One of the most important things that we have to teach the unsaved world is that 1 John 1 is not to them. Okay? Satan's angry because we're a moral people. Satan's angry because we're a people of resistance. We can resist the devil. Satan's angry because Christians are a loving people. 1 Peter 1 and verse 22. You think Satan is very loving? You think he loves people? He's mad that Christians are, are loving. He's mad that we are spirit indwelt people. Romans 8, 9 through 11. It makes him angry. He's angry that Christians are a victorious people. 1 John 5 and verse 4. We've gained the victory through Christ. You know that makes him mad. Uh, Satan is angry because Christians are believing people. Luke 12 and verse 8. John 20 and verse 28. We believe who Christ is. You are my Lord and God. 
We believe it. It makes him mad that we're not doubting who he is. So he's upset. Satan is angry because Christians are a church of Christ people. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. He hates that you're in the church. How much does he hate it? He's angry with you. He's angry with you. Why is Satan angry? Because of your relationship with God. One, as a Christian. And two, because he wants to destroy and prevent all those who are outside of Christ from becoming Christians. That's why he's angry. Thank you for your time and attention.